the Bit Phoenix Enso, people. So this case we have sort of challenged since we first saw it at Computex. We assigned to this case the award of uh, something along the lines of needs work. Maybe not as much of an award as the others. But we said it needed work. We liked a lot of things about the case. At the time, it was pitched to us as 60 to 70 US dollars for tempered glass on the side and addressable RGB LEDs on the front. At 60 to 70 dollars, that's absurdly competitive. But we had a problem with it. We said to the BitPhoenix folks, do you have airflow? And they said, don't worry, we'll fix that for launch. So here we are, launch. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by EVGA and NVIDIA with the Destiny 2 1080 Ti bundle. The 1080 Ti SC2 comes with asynchronous fan control for its dual fans, nine thermal sensors, and again includes Destiny 2. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the conversation at Computex basically went something along the lines of, this is great, 60 to $70 for addressable RGB LEDs, tempered glass, you get all the trends in, you're cheaper than everyone else at the time, and uh, it looks not bad either. So the problem was we basically said you need some ventilation somewhere in the case, because if you look at this case, I'm not talking H500P here. I'm talking like straight, uh, straight up hot box. The front panel does not have ventilation at all, zero. It's got RGB LEDs in it. Now, where would you then go to resolve this. You would put ventilation on the side of the front panel. You might put ventilation on the top and then move back your IO. You could put bigger ventilation on the very bottom. Down here, you'll notice that this panel extends to the table. And the only place there's ventilation, literally, using that word in the most literal sense, the literal only place there's ventilation is there. That's where it gets air. I can't even see it from where I'm standing. That's the ventilation for the case. Now, this is all without even mentioning the fact that the price has gone up. It's now, I think $90, I think it's gone up to 90. So it's no longer 60 to 70. Yeah, at $60, I could probably ignore that and say, you know what, for a cheap case, maybe you buy it, you buy another fan with it, offset the, the cost is offset anyway by the cheapness of the case and uh no big deal we we deal with it you cut a hole somewhere and that's it at 90 dollars, that stuff should be done for you so yeah that's what we're dealing with here today the case still does the rgb led stuff still has a tempered glass the price is higher the ventilation is still non-existent but phoenix did not follow through with what they told me they would do and you've got some stuff like this thing just just to add insult to injury, you know, so once again, ventilation's on the bottom front of that. There's a single fan in the front middle, here. There's another fan in the back rear. And then there's top, uh, just sort of mesh, ventilation, whatever, uh, with no fans on it. So you get sort of passive wafting of air through there. Or you could put this on it and just, just turn your computer into a toaster which we actually tested this thing versus this one. And uh, if you buy this case, do not use this. It has a significant impact in some scenarios. So yeah, um, there are ways to make this case work a lot better than it does stock. And we've tested them and found them and there's hope yet. If you really want it, you can make it work. Just you need to be aware that you basically have to buy a fan or relocate the fans in here because they've done a very poor job on anything to do with air. Uh, so yeah, let's let's go through some of it. Um, features, RGB addressable, has Aura Sync. It's compatible with basically everything. They've got the strips that terminate in the four plug end that you can plug into other strips if you wanted to. Super universal on LED compatibility. Uh, it has dust filters that come out of the sides, which is much appreciated this coming out of the back from uh, the power supply makes very little sense from an ease of use standpoint. So doing it like BitPhoenix is doing here is a great move and that's something they've done well. Um, it'd be nice if they had thought through some of the other stuff that well. I mean, even the, you look at the bottom and 
the feet are so long that even the inch on the bottom where air can kind of get in and out, it's kind of blocked off there too. Uh, filters exist on the front. This one is what is in front of the only fan in the case. Funny thing about dust filters, in order to collect dust, there needs dust has to like actually go through it. Um, so this is in front of a fan, which has no front access to air. And uh, that fan is in the center of the case, right there, pulling air from, remind me, down here. So it's this fan, which is not, not a special static pressure optimized fan or anything, is pulling air from way down here, all the way down here, and trying to get it up here. It's got a filter that the air will presumably go through at some point. And you know what ends up happening is, as we'll talk about in a moment, is uh, the fan ends up recirculating more heat from all of this that sort of drafts forward. It recirculates that more so than pulling clean, cool air in. And um, then you've got, there's this filter down here, which isn't in front of a fan. They don't install one there, though you could, and it would help with GPU thermals. Uh, there is no filter up here in front of this top option, which is kind of curious because they've already got the other two. There's a spot there for a fan, but to be fair, it's almost like admitting that there's no point in putting a fan here, but then putting the mounts there anyway, so you can tick the box on the spec sheet. So you put a fan there, that fan, if you install a fan here, it is now pulling air more than a foot from the bottom of the case. So you've got air that's coming in here, doing a 90 degree turn, losing 30% of its pressure just turning, and then it's getting pulled by two fans that are installed serially and if any air gets past the first one and up here it does its next 90 degree turn and comes into the case so uh, why bit phoenix come on man we talked about this like six months ago numerous times even um let's let's go over the rest of the features of the case i'm going to read some of the stuff that patrick wrote for the review uh, he did the most building in it, so he's got the most notes on the rest of this. And then we'll go through the thermals and noise and everything else. So, our review sample is nearly pure white, obviously. It includes filters and PCIe covers. It's got four LED strips that form a ring on the front panel, matched by an RGB fan in the rear. LEDs are connected to a tiny, but admittedly versatile controller behind the motherboard, with a few baked-in colors and rainbow patterns. The rear fan is translucent and fully changes colors with different lighting, but it's most effective with static colors, like rippling rainbow effects work better on the front panel, for instance. Adapters are also included so that the controller can be bypassed and all LEDs can be controlled with standard 4-pin RGB cables or you go into the motherboard. Overall, the RGB illumination is handled better and seems much less tacked on than it did in the Bitphoenix Shogun, but again, the case has new problems to battle. The front panel is a mess of filters, LEDs, wires, plastic reinforcement, and steel. It's surprisingly heavy for an otherwise lightweight case, and the front panel is certainly sturdy. It borders on overbuilt even. There's even a thick reinforcing frame of plastic behind the steel for really not much reason as of now, but the tooling could be reused. And the front panel looks like it's had a lot of design work and money put into it, but somehow nobody thought to put a vent in it or cut a hole somewhere or on the sides where most people do. We'll elaborate more on that in the thermal section though. The exterior is simple and symmetrical with the exception of three filter handles jutting out from the sides. And to be incredibly nitpicky, the front IO ports aren't quite in a straight line, so they'll fit the curve of the front panel, for example, would be ideal. And the power and hard drive LEDs don't completely line up with their respective holes. The top of the case can optionally be covered with that magnetic mesh filter or solid cover already shown, similar to the Define C, but the cover isn't precisely color matched and the filter looks better. It also works better. These are minor points on an otherwise good looking case externally, and it's clear that BitPhoenix really put some effort into making the various fittings all white, at least, except for the grommets. That, again, no effort into anything regarding cooling. There's no special hinge or mechanism holding the glass on, just four screws at the corners, as expected for a budget case, or what was supposed to be a budget case. Our glass was slightly chipped at one corner, but that could probably be blamed partly on shipping in the very least. 
Installing the motherboard was easy enough, but the power supply presented some difficulties. The Enso's 3.5 inch drive cage is an increasingly common style. It hides beneath the front of the power supply shroud, it fits two drives, and it can be moved forward for additional power supply cable clearance or taken out. Or, well, it could be if it weren't riveted into place. The screw holes for shifting the cage forward are still there, but the cage itself is permanently stuck in a position that bent our power supply cables sharply enough to require disconnecting them and then reconnecting them once the power supply was installed in the case. And anyone here who's done that before knows just how fun it is. The small cutouts in the shroud are poorly placed to provide any relief for this, and the large cutout at the front is permanently open without the removable cover seen in other cases like the Defined C or some of Silverstone's cases. The power supply has to be inserted from the side, not the back, which is somewhat common, but because of the hard drive positioning, it made the cage's placement even more inconvenient. If BitPhoenix hasn't already, they undoubtedly have plans to use the chassis as the basis for more enclosures in the future, which is perfectly fine and normal, but it's frustrating to see evidence of missing features like this. Cable management was acceptable outside of the shroud, but there sure are a lot of cables to manage. The RGB controller is small, but it has a confusing array of adapters plugged into it, despite being connected to just two items. But it does a good job of ensuring that everyone who uses this case will be able to make use of the RGB features in some capacity. Moving into the thermal section again, you can check the article linked in the description below for the full testing methodology and all the other information. We put the ENSO in a needs work category when we saw it at Computex this year, specifically because it lacked front intake. Well, they've added a fan, so it's got front something, but it's not taking air in from the outside. It's taking air in a little bit from the bottom. Air is intended to flow between the front legs of the case, up through the front panel, about several inches anyway, or one full foot if you install the fan at the top, and then there's theoretical possibility of adding additional 120mm fans above and below the center one, though they would all be installed somewhat serially in a line. The filter only partially covers the intake path once again, and we criticized the H500P pretty heavily for some of the same reasons that we're now criticizing the Enso for, but it did at least have some mash over each of the intended intake vents and had some kind of breathability there, more so than this thing does. And that included a little mesh apron under the H500P that was added post Computex to resolve some dust concerns. The Enso doesn't even get that far. One potential problem with the stock configuration is that it's easier for the intake fan to pull hot air from the inside of the case than to pull cool air from the outside. There are big, empty fan bays immediately above and below it, while the, quote, real vent is relatively small and far away, and partially obstructed by superfluous lower filters. The filters and their slots are completely removable, but doing so leaves holes in the case. Normally, the solution to these problems would be to put more fans in, but the top slot has no filter. For additional tests this time, we tried five different ways of forcing some air into the Enso. With the stock configuration, we tried with the front panel off as usual. We tried with the top fan bay sealed and the top and bottom fan bay sealed simultaneously. And then we tried adding additional 120mm intake fans, first in the front of the case, then in the top front of the case. And we also finally tested in the stock configuration with the solid cover on top of the case than the magnetic mesh filter and all the other tests. This testing, we're starting with the torture testing, initiates only with the ENSO. We'll add comparative data in a moment. Our standard torture test raised the CPU to 64.2 degrees above ambient, with the CPU temperature peaking 10 degrees Celsius away from TJ Maxx, so 90 degrees if you're getting rid of the whole delta T over ambient thing. CPU temperature usually doesn't matter much in our testing, but it does here. Putting the non-mesh cover on top of the case caused the CPU to hit TJ Maxx 100 degrees Celsius during peak load and begin throttling, which is certainly an achievement in its own right. In the PureBase 600, another warm case that we tested, opening the top vent didn't contribute much to CPU cooling as the air actively blows from front to back. With the Enso, the heat builds up so much in the case that it can be felt rising passively from the CPU cooler and just sort of naturally drafting out of the top vent. The solid cover resulted in a 71.1 degree final score, so to speak, but that would have continued to climb had throttling not occurred. Taking the front panel completely off dramatically swung the results in the other direction, with one of the largest temperature drops we've seen so far. 
We went down 14.1 degrees from stock to 50.1 degrees Celsius over ambient. We tried to claw back some of that 14.1 degree gap with the front panel actually installed, first by sealing the fan bays and then by adding fans. Sealing the top bay caused no improvement and may have made air less available to the intake fan. Recycling hot air though is still better than nothing. Sealing both empty fan bays didn't hurt performance, but improvement still wasn't outside of range of variance. Even adding a 120mm knock to a fan to the front pointed directly at the heatsink no less, normally a surefire way of dropping CPU temperatures, scored a paltry 2.5 degrees lower than stock temperature. That's because it simply cannot breathe. There's zero air access in that top slot. The only truly effective configuration we tested was adding an intake fan to the top of the case, pointing downwards, which scored 51.8 degrees Celsius over ambient, just slightly warmer than removing the front panel, and uh, if nothing else, CPU thermals benefit tremendously from top intake with this case. Like we've said before, heat may rise, but cold air can pretty much go wherever you want when you blast it through a fan. Comparatively, despite all that talk about the ENSO's front panel, it's still not the worst case for CPU temperatures that we've tested. The N1805 Infinity, Corsair Spec 04, and Be Quiet PureBase 600 and Thermaltake G21 all had pretty poor CPU cooling and higher deltas as well. The tragedy of the ENSO, however, is that it really can't be improved that well, not even by sticking extra fans into the front of it. Top intake does fix the CPU temperatures, actually impressively, and that puts it in the Corsair 570X range, but that only really benefits the CPU. We need to check the GPU section next to see if there's any negative impact from pushing that warmed air into the GPU backside. With the ENSO only on the screen now, GPU Delta T over ambient was 61.9 degrees stock, warm enough to lock the clock speed down to 1708 MHz, with another dramatic drop from the front panel removal, 10.1 degrees this time. Again, any positive effects from taping off the fan bays were canceled out by the lower overall volume of air moved, even if it was warmer air. And the oddest result was the GPU temperature with an additional front fan. Instead of lowering, the GPU temperature went up several degrees to 67.7. And if you think about it, this isn't impossible. The extra fan changed the airflow pattern enough that it negatively affected the GPU. This was repeatable and verified with other log data and adding a fan to the top of the case had even less effect on the GPU than taping the fan base, resulting in functionally the same GPU temperature as the stock configuration. So we're still locked down to 1708 MHz. Again, we've tested worse cases with stock deltas, but even the Antec P8, looking at comparative data now, was capable of showing improvement with extra fans. The Enso doesn't have this headroom, and as a result, it's stuck performing little better than the stock Corsair Spec 04, at GPU cooling especially, and that's a case that came with only one fan and retails for $50. Both cases try to use a single intake fan to direct airflow at the GPU and also above it to the CPU, and both fail. GPU temperature during looping of Firestrike Extreme tests had it at 59.8 degrees Celsius, just above the Spec 04, and again on par with other mediocre results like the Define C, the stock Mesh of C without the extra fans, and the Antec P8. All of these have shrouds limiting airflow at the bottom of the case and increasing GPU temperatures. This is a real world gaming workload and temperatures this high can definitely cause dropped clock speeds on the GPUs. Adding ambient back in gets us to around 82 degrees Celsius or throttle point on Pascal cards. And you can solve for this technically. You could configure a custom fan curve on the GPU, increase it to maybe 60, 70%, something like that. And you'd basically end up a little bit below throttle point. It's not the best solution because then you increase your noise and that was Phoenix's argument for this closed off front panel when we asked about it. So not really ideal, but it can be done. Our blender test is a realistic production workload that avoids some of the potential pitfalls of torture tests like runaway thermals or throttling to standard 100C. In this scenario, the ENSO is 42.2 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient is right between the Antec P8 and Corsair Spec 04. GPU temperature in Blender testing was actually below the PA and effectively tied with the Define C, but still at the high end of the scale. Without the heat caused by an intense workload like Firmark or Firestrike, GPU clock speed remained just under 2000 MHz for the duration of the render, proving just how much you lose when doing anything like gaming, where we were dropping to 1700 MHz or so. The ENSO isn't a noise suppressing case by any means, 
but its noise output is just about average. The one benefit of completely sealing the front panel is that very little sound reaches our dB meter. 35.9 dBA is equivalent to the Shogun or Rosewell Cullinan, both of which have three 120 millimeter stock fans, cool better, and have the same noise level. Putting the magnetic cover on the top of the case instead of the breathable filter causes only imperceptible improvement, and we'd recommend against doing it at all. We've had concerns about the Enso for as long as we've been aware of it. We've made those concerns very clear since the beginning, and uh, we're told even at Computex that it wasn't the final version and that the final version would have better ventilation. We were also told that it would be something like $20 to $30 cheaper than it is. So this is another story of a case that shipped at a higher price than it was ever meant to, and it's paying for that, obviously. The case also, even competing against BitPhoenix's own options, yeah, the portal looks pretty good. It has some thermal concerns, but it is a good looking case. The Shogun is visually polarizing, but does have pretty decent thermals and acoustics. So BitPhoenix knows how to make a case that performs well. The Aurora case doesn't look bad either. So we look forward to seeing BitPhoenix apply some of this knowledge and experience they obviously have to a case like this, a budget case. But for now, if you're looking for something in a similar price range that's way better, we'd recommend the Meshify C as a tempered glass alternative. It's not as flashy, it doesn't have the RGB LEDs, so if you want those things, then probably look elsewhere. But ideally, look elsewhere other than this, and maybe just buy the RGB LED strip separately or something like that. Uh, otherwise, buy this thing and make sure you buy an extra fan for it in your configuration. Set the fan as top intake, that'll help the CPU. For the GPU, set the fan curve such that it exceeds the uh, stock curve. Most stock fan curves for GPUs top out at around 55%. You'll want to go past that and make sure the GPU is staying under 80C. Now, Pascal, different content really here, but Pascal uh, ultimately performs the best under 60C but good luck getting that in this case at all. So that's it for this one. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus if you want to help us out directly. We'll put a link to the article written review version in the description below if you prefer that layout. Subscribe for more. Store.GamersNexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one or one of our stickers to also support us directly. And I'll see you all next time.